Oh, oh, this video is not sponsored or endorsed by Cart Door. Oh, Model Making Guru is sponsored by emodels.co.uk. Make something awesome. Hey everyone, it's Fox from ModelMaking.Guru here. Now, I'm going to have to be a little bit quiet and real quick, because apparently my joint honours degree in explaining vegetables and horse physics from the university that means I'm not a proper medical doctor, apparently, and security around here are kind of tenacious. Anyway, welcome to a brand new series, Tabletop Trauma Center, where I take in abominations that I find on eBay and elsewhere, models that have been painted with potatoes, elbows and dead cats, and fix them up right nice. Now my aim here is not to embarrass or humiliate anyone, but rather to point out the things that have gone wrong and on the off chance that they ever see the video, tell them how to make things better. It will be an occasional series that will pop up as I find traumatised and abandoned models to adopt. So without further ado, because I can hear them come in, let's take a look through our very first patient file. Ladles and jelly spoons I present to you on the very, very noisy, spinny thing of happiness. It is our first patient, patient one of the Tabletop Trauma Centre, the Lehman Russ Demolisher or Vanquisher or some such type variant. Oh, is he not glorious? Is this not just a screaming example of the might and power of the Imperium of Man? It is, you can see why I, with the moment I saw this on eBay, not only did I know I had to set up the whole Tabletop Trauma Centre series, this was the inspiration, but also I had to have this, I had to have this to repaint it. It's glorious, glorious. Now, the important thing to remember, like I said, is we're not going to character assassinate the person that painted this. That's not the aim of this series. Imagine that I'm talking to that person, I'm going to show them where they've gone wrong and how they can do better. So I'm going to teach that person. We don't know the situation and the circumstances of this build. We don't know who built this and what was going on when they built it. So it's not fair to sort of, you know, rip someone to pieces when this person may have had uh, some impairment that meant this is the best they could do. They may have just been starting out and I don't want to discourage them. It might have been painted a year ago and that person is still painting. And if I sit there and rip it to pieces, they're never going to paint again. Or this person could have passed away and I don't want to, that, that wouldn't sit well with me. So you know, it could be somebody selling off all the stuff that somebody left behind. So we're not going to do that. We're going to assume that the person is watching someday, somehow. And we're going to show them how they could have done it better. So let's have a look at this. Yeah, I mean, for the first off, I, this, this dust on it, this dust is not my dust. This dust came with it. This has been sat gathering dust, very sad in a corner somewhere. This has not been played on a tabletop, if ever, for a very long time. But yes, this is... He's gone for an interesting colour scheme. He's got the green and black camouflage with the white and the red on the turret which i'm not quite getting the mixture of like forest and arctic color scheme and then this lovely world war one style stripe down the front which i do like that i do not obviously the way he's painted it but i do like this idea of the stripe it could be a lot better there it's a bit unsubtle now you can see his brush painted it as it goes round. you can see all the enormous brush marks we will make sure we get no brush marks because it's been brush painted i think we'll do a brush paint job on this i don't think we'll do any airbrushery because assuming that this person, you know, this is as far as they got, I want to show them how they could have done better using the same sort of setup. If there's some airbrushing on here, I'll probably airbrush it. But we're not going to do that. We're going to do some brush paintery. Maybe. I don't. I might change my mind. We'll see how it goes. Now, you can see here, like I said, he has gone very, th ironically, he's gone thick with the paint so you can actually see brush marks. But in other cases, he's gone thin with the paint. And you can see here the green on the turret is all kind of patchy because he's just either painted it over a black primer base or he's just not put enough paint on anyway. So I think he probably did a black primer base and then painted the green on top. So what I'm going to do, 
Uh, I'm going to stay true to his colour scheme. I know, I know, it's insanity. I know, he's got a white turret with green. I, I don't, it makes no sense. But then again, it's 40k, it never makes any sense. But this makes no sense at all. But I'm going to stick to this colour scheme. So I'm going to take lots of reference pictures. Get my words out. Reference pictures with the different colour schemes. I do like this. We'll keep that, obviously. Against my better judgment, we'll keep the colour scheme on the turret. Uh, and we'll just reproduce it and we'll try and do it a lot better. Now it is a bit damaged, you can see there's bits missing on the on the dozer blade there and it's not drilled out the barrels, heresy. Uh, and there's a cover missing here on this bit here, but it makes it like a nice stowage barrel or a stowage bin. So what I might do, I might go into my bits box and dig out some bits and things that I can just add to this. There are some bits I need to repair. Uh, there is an aerial here that I might see if I can do something with. There's also this half of the, the hatch here on the cupola, on the, um, on the cupola. On the well, it is the cupola, isn't it? On the turret, there's half a hatch here, but there's no hatch on that side, so it's half a hatch. Which is, uh, but what I might do is take that off and put a proper hatch on the back, which makes more sense because he's got half a hatch there. So where's the other half of the hatch? It's just not there. So we're going to fix that. Uh, anything else that, that springs to mind as I go along? There's something snapped off here, so I might stick some bits and bobs on there. Uh, and I won't really know too much about this until once I've got the paint off, I can see what's on there. You know, uh, what is he? How's he? I'll see various tells about the manufacturer. There might be lots of gaps I need to fill and things like that. So we shall see. Now, the interesting thing about this model is, obviously, it's a plastic kit, except the pilot, the, the pilot, what am I talking about? The commander. He's actually metal. He's actually a metal figure. I'll take this off. Uh, now, unfortunately, that has broken and I can't fix that. So this will be a bit wibbly wobbly. But it's actually a metal, you can see there, hopefully, it's actually a metal commander. So I don't know how old this is. I didn't even know there were metal commanders, but let's just, take a, I don't know if this will focus on him, but let's just take a quick look at the face. Mm. Now, yes, we'll look at the figure. He's obviously painted a blue uniform here with gold trim, but what's actually painted is a black primer coat, blue paint very thinly, so it's kind of semi-transparent. The flesh color very thinly, so it's semi-transparent. Yellow for gold, very thinly over blue, which basically makes it come out green a bit because it's too thin. And he's put a black line around the mouth for I don't know why. And he's got like a tiny eye, an enormous eye. He could be a cameraman. So, yeah, we need to fix all of that. What I'm seeing here basically is uh, a very inexperienced painter. I can't get that on now. A very inexperienced painter, uh, either very, very young or just very inexperienced, who's making a lot of the classic mistakes. He's painting thinly over a black primer coat, which is not a problem. You can paint over a black primer coat, but you have to be keenly aware of the paint that goes over the top. Uh, and he's painting uh, without mixing paint, without thinning paint in some places, because you've got brush marks, and painting too thin in others, or painting colours that are too thin by their default, like this looks like Uriel Yellow, although it probably isn't, it's probably older than that. Uh, but he's painted with his yellow colour without building up a base colour underneath to make it work as a yellow. And I don't know why I went for yellow and not gold. But again, this might be a really, really old model. It may have been painted 20 years ago. It could have been painted before Citadel's colours came out. He may have just had a range. He may have just had like a big stack of, I don't know, Humbrol paints or Ravel paints. So we don't know what he painted with. These could actually be enamels for all I know. I don't know. I can't tell till I've tried to strip them off. So this is the plan. Get this stripped off. And then we're going to show the person that painted this, whoever that may be, because he might watch this one day, how to try and paint it looking this colour scheme but much better. So what I'm going to do, I'll go and get everything ready. And we shall crack on. I'll just let... Oh, it is just glorious. I mean... Oh, look at the dust. Okay, so the first part of the process is, of course, to remove this shonky super chunk paint. Now, you could skip this whole part of the process if you wanted to. If you're repainting something that you did in your youth and you've dug it out of a cupboard and you're like, oh my God, when I painted this, I used half a potato. I can paint much better now. Thank you very much. Like and subscribe. Then, you know, you'd be forgiven for just priming over it and repainting it. I can't do that here, though, because first of all, it bears the mark of its maker. It's got brush marks everywhere and little rough bits and stuff that will show through the primer coat, even if I reprime it. And also there's some bits where the paint has pooled and obscured some rivet detail and things like that. I need to get rid of that and just get back to bare plastic. So we need to do that now. So what do we need to do this? Very simple. 
I'm going to use a product called Dettol, which is commonly widely available here in the UK for a couple of quid for a bottle. Available in Europe as well, and in the US I think you can get it, but it might be expensive, so you might need to look into alternative products like Purple Power or Simple Green, things like that. Uh, you can use things like Terps and White Spirit to strip paint. I don't recommend it because they stink, they're horrible, and they may damage the plastic. But Dettol uh, is basically an antiseptic product for cleaning wounds, but it contains chloris... Chlor 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 Oh, I hate science words. Chlorozylenol and xylene is a paint stripper or widely used as a paint stripper. So this is a form or a derivative of xylene, chlorozylenol. It's a little less harmful on plastics, but it will strip most paints. Star, star, it may not. Not every single, I mean, there will be some exceptions, but most paints for our purposes, acrylics, lacquers, enamels, it'll take them off no problem. It won't do any harm to your model. I wouldn't recommend using this on a Bandai kit because Bandai plastic is weird, but any other model, you'd be absolutely fine. Now, how exactly do you use it to strip paint? Easy peasy, cheesy peas, dead easy. Put your model in a container, make sure it's a container with a lid because you're gonna need to seal it later and make sure the container's tall enough to fit the entire model in. And all you do is you basically just pour the Dettol in a bit like this. And that's all you do. Pour it in, use it neat. Don't dilute it. You can if you want, but you don't need to. It works a bit faster if it's neat. Basically, cover it in Dettol, put the lid on, and then leave it. Now, depending on the paint that's on the model, and I don't know what paint's on here, it could take half an hour, it could take an hour, it could take a day. As a matter of course, I'd say leave it overnight if you can, just to start with, just to give it time to work. Because like I said, you don't know what paint you've got on here. Now, the other thing is, although it does smell nice, it can be an overpowering smell. So make sure your container has a lid and make sure to put it somewhere out of the way. I left mine in the kitchen overnight, but it still stank the house out. If you've got a shed or a garage, you can do it in, that's better. And try not to do it in your workroom where your workbench is, because it will just give you the fumes of death. You won't, you won't be harmed, it's just a bit overpowering. So make sure you've got a lid on it make sure you can put it somewhere out of the way. Once it's been sat for long enough, get yourself a scrutty old toothbrush and it's time for the next step. This has been sat for about 20 hours because I had to go off and do other things then I went to bed. And all we're going to do is basically start scrubbling away with the toothbrush. You're gonna to be gentle with it, don't go in heavy handed, but all you need to do is start scrubbing away. Now, if it's not fully worked its magic, then you'll see the paint doesn't really wanna come off and all you need to do is put it back in and leave it for another few hours maybe. But I left it for 20 hours and although it's not coming off immediately, a little bit of a gentle scrub sees the paint starting to come off and you just need to work your way around the model scrubbing as you go. Now, one very important thing, do not, do not, do not get any water anywhere near this. At this stage, the only liquid on this model should be Dettol. You want to get all the paint off there. You'll still have a few little bits and bobs left, little marks here and there and bits in recesses, that's fine. But you want to get all the paint off. If you add water while there's still paint on the model, that paint will become like a gelatinous, horrible, clumpy mess that you'll never get off. Now you will need to rinse it at the end of the process to get any Dettol off the surface so that it doesn't affect any future paint coats. But here's the guide. Get it in the Dettol, scrub it down, scrub it down, get all the paint off. When you're happy there's no more paint to come off, then you transfer it to some warm water with a little bit of washing up liquid in it, a little bit of dish soap. That's a surfactant, it breaks anything away from the surface. Get it in some warm soapy water and then scrub it gently with another toothbrush, a different one, just to get any Dettol off the model. When that's done, leave it to dry in the air for 24 hours and you're good to go. Just never ever get this wet while it's still got paint on it and Dettol. That will just end in sadness, maximum sadness, total sad factory. Okay, so there we go. They've now been stripped back. Now they are just drying nicely and ready to roll. Now that the paint is off, of course, it does allow us to see some things that we couldn't see before. We knew the dude on here was metal. What we didn't know, what I didn't know, when I was taking the mickey out of him having half a hatch on this side, it turns out there was originally another half on this side. When I cleaned off all the paint and crud, I could see some broken roughed up plastic there, which suggests there was originally a hatch on there. Now when I started scrubbing this, this hatch just pinged off because it wasn't glued very well, which is fine. I was going to take it off anyway. Also, we can see massive, massive seam lines that the person has left 
thanks for that we've got to fill those and we can see there was something glued here now i can't remember if there's like a piece of armor that goes on the side here. i think there is that's clearly long been pinged off somehow i don't quite know how but this is the weird thing there was something glued on there but when i got this tank this was all painted over so i don't quite get that the builder put something on here then broke that off and then painted it i'm not quite getting that unless of course the person that painted this isn't the person that built it that's entirely possible so yeah there's something we need to clean that up it may have been a plate on there i don't think i've got a spare piece of plating for that so what i might need to do uh, is perhaps cobble together something with some plastic cards and some rivets we shall see also the uh the mint the min mintel mintel's not a real word <laughs> how is a mintel the man no not even man it's pintle there we go i'm, I'm confused i'm trying to say like pintle and think my brain's going mantle and then what's coming out is mintel oh, hang on i need more i need more i've not got much coffee left look oh, oh brain food the pintle uh, is completely knackered i might see if i can somehow repair that if not i might have to just snip it away and don't know we'll see what i can do with that i'm not sure what i can do with that there we'll have a look I've also learned uh, that the uh, sponson weapons are metal. Look at that, which explains why they didn't drill the barrel out, so I'll, I'll forgive them for that one as well. These are actually metal. Now, I've spoken to my good friend Cy Reynolds, our Lord and Saviour Kevin, who tells me in his vast knowledge that this means this is a really, really old kit. Like vintage, vintage Lehman Russ, like really old. On the other one, you can see it pinged off when I was cleaning it. That's purely because the numpty that made it, I shouldn't say that really, it left this honking great nub the size of Paris. So actually then again, I can say that because that isn't lack of experience, that's lack of taking care. I won't criticise someone for their painting too much with them and be too harsh, but I will shout at them if they leave a nub that big on there. So this was attached purely by the tiny little nub. So when I'm scrubbing it, it just pinks straight off. The super glue didn't have much to hold on to. So we'll have to clean that down. I did learn that the person that built this cannot glue anything straight at all. That's not straight. That's not straight. The dozer blade is... I mean, the dozer blade is wibbly wobbly anyway. That's not connected to that properly and that's not connected to this very well. That's barely vaguely straight. That's not straight. I don't know. That's not straight. The exhausts aren't quite... I, it's not a complicated kit to build the Lima Russ. I'm not quite sure where this builder went wrong. Hmm. Very weird. You can see as well they have used tube cement or like, you know, the Citadel Games Workshop cement because you can see how it's discoloured. You don't get that with things like Tamiya Extra Thin or the, the you know, the, the wicking cements. They don't do that. This is proper squidgy cement. So, yeah, we're not going to be using glue like that. There'll be quite a bit of sanding required on this, I think, just to get rid of some glue splotches, but nothing too major. The big thing I did learn, these tracks. I spent about a minute and a half trying to scrub the black primer off these tracks. They're black plastic. I've never seen this before. Simon, I asked Simon and he's like, I don't know what that means. It's an old Lehman Russ, but I've never seen that before. So if you know what this means, I can only assume either that at some point in the olden days, in the before times, that Games Workshop used to provide tracks in black plastic, or perhaps this is third party tracks. Maybe the builder of this lost some track components and bought a set of third party tracks. I don't know. I've never seen it before, so I don't know what this means. But yeah, I spent a minute and a half scrubbing the paint off these, only to realise there's no actual paint on them. So the next step now is just to let this fully dry off. Then we'll go in and I'll stick on some extra bits and bobs. I might add some plating here and there with some rivets just to hide some sins. So let me let this dry off. When we come back, we'll do some sort of construction. I'll have a look through my bits box and have a good rummage. Good rummage. Ooh. Okay, so that's now all dry and we're ready to roll. Uh, what I've gone and done is prepare for the next step because the next step, the first real creative step we're going to do is to start adding some greebles to this kit just to make it more interesting. I've been through my bits box and I found little bits of armor plating and some bits and bobs and a searchlight. I've made some things out of plastic card because we're going to add them to the surface. And these are just things that are going to add more interest and more detail to the model. But we want to basically prepare this model first to receive these greebles and I need to cut a few bits off and trim a few bits and the first thing I want to do is take off this uh, flamer I keep forgetting what it is it's a melter or flamer what I've got I've got a couple of bolters 
uh, from a Lehman Rust kit or from a few Lehman Rust kits uh, that I need to tweak around. I've got to basically adjust these to fit, but I want to replace these with these bolters. So what I need to do first of all is get this one off. Now the other one came off no problem when I was washing it, so I'm going to guess this one is not too heavily attached, but I've got a pair of pliers here in case I need to smash it off. <laughs> Violence! But I'm going to try just breaking it off first. I don't want to be too violent because I don't want to stress the plastic. Oh! Okay, well that was ridiculously easy. Yeah, that just came off. That was not even really properly glued at all. Okay, well that's brilliant. It was attached with super glue. What I was going to do, the reason I had the pliers, and it goes back in again, uh, with super glue. Super glue can be quite grippy, but it's very delicate when it's given shock. So if I was desperate and I couldn't break it off by hand, I would have just gone and it would have shattered the glue and broken it off. But I didn't need to because it just came off. Cool. Well, we can put that to one side. Now, the bolters that I've got here that came with the different Lehman Rust kit, you can see they've got this big peg piece here that's supposed to slot in. That's no use to me because that's not going to fit on there. So what I need to do is adjust this and I need to make this one basically look like that. If you can see it there, let's get it in my hand. I want it to look like that. So we need to get this peg off the end. I need to drill out the barrel as well. So let's do that first. Right, so I need to sort off this nub bit and we need to drill this barrel out. Now this is the first time I've had a chance to use one of my brand new purchases, my actual first ever modeling saw, my hobby saw. I've never had one of these before. I've always wanted one and always needed one, usually on a build at least once per build, but I've never kind of got one. It's the first time I've had one. Finally, I've got one. So here we go. Now, if you've got a little hacksaw, that I do, but I do recommend getting yourself one of these hobby saws. I got this from my good friends at eModels, of course. It was like five or six quid, I think. It's not expensive and it'll last me a long time. So this isn't particularly rocket science, this bit. Literally, I want to cut it down to this plate here. I want this plate at the back, that's the surface I'm going to adhere it to the model with. So I want to keep that. And all I want to do is first of all, put the right glasses on because that will be helpful. Idiot. So I can see what I'm doing. <sighs> right. Let's get this thing sawed. So I'm going to line it up roughly, which is about there. I'm just going to, excuse me. Now this may well make everything wobble. If the camera wobbles at this point, apologies, it probably will. Now this isn't the Tamiya hobby saw. I forget who made this now. It probably sounds terrible as well with the microphone because the microphone's attached to the desk. So it's probably really bassy, I do apologize. Uh, but yeah, all I'm gonna do is quickly saw through this, get it nice and flat. And there we go. Yeah, perfect. So that's that, but we can throw that away. I'm gonna file this flat. I'm using a metal file because a metal file will keep it flat. I don't want it to have a curve to it. If I use a sanding stick, that'll be bendy and squishy and it might end up with a curved surface and I don't want that. So what I'm going to do now is get my scribing tool. Oops. And use a trick that resin models use, which is whenever you're going to super glue two surfaces together, score the surface so that the super glue has a chance to grip better. It just gives a rough surface. The super glue can work its way into these little scrapes and scratches uh, and just have a bit more tooth. It gives it a more toothy surface. Next, we need to drill the barrel. Uh, now, this is very easy, uh, and I will guarantee you, you'll make a mess of it, but it's easy to fix. We need to drill the barrel here, down through the side, the little exhaust on either side of the barrel, and also down the middle of the barrel itself. Now, the first thing to make sure is that the barrel is completely flat. You don't want the big, there's usually a nub in the middle, sand that down, file it down, file it away. Now, I'm going to use the Citadel drill bit, the pin vise, but you don't need to use Citadels, you can use any pin vise. However, their bits are just exactly the right size. <laughs> it's just kind of handy. So we're going to use their biggest bit, which is here. Now, if I seem a bit at odds, by the way, and a bit a bit uh, do lally, it's because I've got some new magnifiers for my for my uh, glasses. I'll show you them when I've got this in. Hang on, I'll just get this drill bit in first. It's not really in very well, but never mind. I've got some new magnifiers. I've got uh, these things which sit on top of my glasses. Uh, little cheap things, they were five or six quid from Amazon. And I'm trying these instead of the Space Helmet of Seeing, just because the Space Helmet of Seeing is great, but it's enormous. 
and it gets in the way. So I'm trying these out. And at the moment, it's making the desk look like it's cambered at 45 degrees going up that way. It's really, I expect everything to roll off down here. It's very strange. Very, very strange. Right, anyway, enough waffle. So what we're going to do is we're going to simply put that in there and start to drill. Now, like I say, you can use your own drill, but, you, you know, pin vices are 10 a penny. They're not expensive. I do have to say that aside from the squeakage, uh, this Citadel drill is one of the most comfortable drills I've ever used. Hand drills, hand vices. They're also called pin vices or hand drills. And there we go. And it pops through to the side. Hopefully, Omnissiah willing. God Emperor of Man willing, it's lined up with the one on the other side. Usually they do. It's fairly good about that. As long as you keep it fairly straight as far as you can. We now have the exhaust. I think it's the exhaust or the muzzle brake. It might be the muzzle brake. I'm not sure. But anyway, that's done. I always recommend doing that bit first because it makes this next bit easier. Now, what we need to do now is drill out this barrel. Now, what some people will do is they will mark it. Mark it. They will mark it with a knife blade or a pin or something where they think the middle is roughly. And I'll, I'll do that just to show you. But it doesn't really matter. So I'm going to very roughly... Put a little ding in there where I think roughly where the middle is. Just so I've got something to seat the drill bit in. Because these, the Games Workshop uh, Citadel drill bits, they are good, but they're not the sharpest in the world. So it's good to give them a little thing to start. And all you do is, like we've just done now, just start drilling. Now, don't worry too much. Do your best to get it in the middle and do your best to knock the camera. But don't worry if it starts to be a little bit off centre because we can fix that. Unless I do actually get it in the centre, in which case I can't show you how to fix it. <laughs> so hopefully we get it a little off centre. But I guarantee you, 95% of the time when you drill a barrel, you will not get it in the middle. And you'll knock the camera every time. There we go. Now, because I drilled this, uh, the muzzle brake out first, or the, the vent, whatever it is. I'm going to keep saying muzzle brake because it sounds great, but I don't know if it is. I'm sure you can tell me in the, in the comments. Because we drilled that out first, it just goes chunk when it's hit that. And that's as far as you need to go. Now, you can see here. I'll put that on there. I can move it in closer. That is not centered at all. But you know what? It's not a problem. Because all you do is get yourself your blade. Make sure you've got a nice sharp blade. And this is where you've got to be careful now. You get your blade. What we want to do, you want to basically, this, this, this thickness of barrel here, you want it to be about the same all the way around. All you do is you get your knife blade and the bit that you want to carve away quite simply that's all you do you get your blade and you just very gently run it round that part of the barrel where you need to carve away some of the plastic to make it thinner not the whole barrel I'm just carving this bit here so it matches the other side now it's gonna look rough it's not gonna be nice and clean don't worry about that just yet just worry about getting it looking about all the same thickness all the way around Looks horrible, that does. It looks absolute rubbish. Look at that. I'll zoom in a bit for you. Looks terrible, that does. Don't worry, because I've got a magic fix for you. All we care, all we care about right now is making it look about the same thickness. Because what we do next is the magic bit. Okay. What we do now is we come in with our Tamiya Extra Thin. And we simply run it around the inside of the muzzle like that and over the top. Now it's not going to be perfect, but it's better than having a solid solid barrel, in my words out. And what you're doing is, Tamiya Extra Thin is a welding cement, it melts the plastic. And what you're doing is, because we've been doing all the scrapey scrapey, it's got rough jagged edges. When we put a little bit of Tamiya Extra Thin, and not a lot, just enough to wet it basically, it melts those jaggedy bits and softens them down. And they become harder to see. And when that's dried and got a coat of primer on it, there won't be any jaggedy jaggedy. It'll look nice, but you have to also keep in mind, I'll show you there now so you can see what it looks like. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, keep in mind, of course, when you paint this, You'll be doing a black wash or a shade or something inside the barrel. So even if there was a little bit of jiggity jaggedy rough edges in there, that would then end up being very dark. You'd have the barrel will be a metallic silver colour of some sort. You may even put some heat staining on it or carbon scoring. 
but inside the barrel would be dark and you wouldn't necessarily see anything apart from blackness. So that, as a quick get around, is a perfect way to get a nice drill barrel that looks spot on, that nobody's ever going to look close enough to see that you've drilled it out and carved it. Okay, let's get these things stuck on. Now I'm going to be using for the first part here uh, some high viscosity industrial gauge super glue. This is Everbuild. Now I do recommend you don't just go and get a tube of super glue from your corner shop. That tends to be not very good stuff. You want proper either industrial or specifically model making CA glue, uh, which is just a bit better for the job. Now I'm going to use thick glue here because the intention for the moment is just to get it to stick on. And this couldn't be easier. What I'm going to do is get a healthy dobulus of the glue here and we're just going to plonk it on this metal bit here just a few splobs I don't need a lot because I'm going to reinforce it with something else in a moment so we'll put that there we we'll get ourselves an bolter and we'll hope we can get this done straight and true so we will quickly get that on now that I'm not I'm not a big fan of super glue because it's kind of one of those once it's on it's on and you're kind of screwed if you do it wrong glues but that didn't go too bad it's on. It will fall off if I mess around with it. So we'll put it on there for a second. Lovely jubbly. You can see there, they're on now. Now they'll take another 20, 30 seconds to cure a bit more. So what I can do is I can go in with some kicker, which is just an accelerant. I'm not going to do it on camera because I'll be spraying it on my desk, but I'm just going to spray this on here very quickly. There we go. I'm using Bob Smith Industries Insta Set. It's just a kicker, basically. It just makes the super glue cure straight away. And what I'm going to do now is blow on that to let it flash off a little bit. There we go. And what I need to do now is come in with some thin super glue. Now I have here some Zap CA Thin CA. Same kind of stuff. It's just really, really vi uh, viscous. Not viscous. It's like you can see it there. It's, it's like water. Now I would never recommend taking this from the bottle. You can't put it on a piece of plastic because it, it literally is like water. What I recommend you do is get yourself one of these little applicators as they would say in Star Trek and be very careful if you're lucky you've not glued the lid on no there we go there it goes there the applicator simply I'm just going to give this a quick wipe always have a piece of tissue handy for super glue bottles get rid of any excess put that on there and all I'm going to do these are disposable by the way all I'm going to do very quickly is if I can run this between the plastic and the metal just to reinforce that joint even more it's starting to come through now it's coming through now Khan shooting through the tube I've got to be keeping an eye on it there we go splodge it in there and a bit like Tamiya Extra Thin that will scoot into the gap and just double up on the glue in that joint there we go beautiful I used to hate using uh, thin super glue. I really used to hate using it because I'd make a mess. I'd try and apply it with a stick or something and it would never end well because it's just like water, especially for putting on like tiny bits of photo etch and stuff. But getting these little applicators, it's changed my entire world. It blew my tiny dinosaur mind. I don't need to put any on here, but I'll put a tiny amount anyway. Just a touch and I'm going to hit it with the kicker again so apologies I'll have to go off camera just a quick zizz oops <laughs> I'll explain what that cracking noise was in a second Alrighty, so that's those glued on now now that cracking sound you heard just before we finished the last section uh, the thin glue had got down the side there and stuck that to the plastic and I had to kind of go crack and snap it back out again quickly before it set too hard that's thin glue is fantastic but devious it will go everywhere so if you've got moving parts that need to stay moving just keep an eye on them next we need to do a little bit of uh, remedial work we've got these big gaps here remember where they've not quite glued these together very well. I don't know how, it's not particularly hard to make those sponsons. And also this honking great gap down here. Now I'm going to use an old, old trick to fix this basically, which is to basically cover it with some plastic card. It's uh, an old Weasley trick that I've used many, many times. I've got to find my tweezers. Old trick that I've used many, many times uh, that it's just an easy way to fix things. 
there's many ways you can fill gaps. You can fill it with putties, you can use thick glues and sprue glues. I can't get this out. Hang on. Knife time. Uh, you can use putties and sprue glues and things like that. Or if you just want an easy time of it and it fits with the aesthetic, you can just simply use some plastic card. So what I've made here, I've just basically trimmed down some plastic card to look appropriate. Now on these sponsons here, you'll see we have this kind of ribbing that I need to clean up that seam. I've just noticed it there, that mold line. I need to clean that up, but it's got this like rim of strip around the edge of rivets. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a strip here and add some rivets later. And on the front here, we're just going to add a strip and then put some rivets on top. I was going to use the fast setting cement so I can um, get it in place, but I may just have to use some regular cement just for a moment just to lock it down. Let's see if we can get this into place roughly. Now, apologies if this goes off camera. Um, it's very tricky to do this at the best of times. I'm trying to do it without locking the camera like that. And so you can see it is even harder. So there we go, that's in place and locked in the corner. I'll get some of the fast setting cement just to lock it in place quickly. I shall run it there, just down there. Now what I can do is the same again here. I can run some fast cement there. But you've got to be quick. This stuff flashes off like bilio in like a microsecond. So I'm just going to push it down. Hope it sticks. Hope I've got it straight. I've got it straight. It didn't stick. Which is fine because it wasn't actually straight anyway. So it needs to be there. Let's get some regular cement. Regular cement, well, the regular Tammy Extra Thin won't have cured and stuck very fast, but it doesn't flash off quite as quickly. So I do have a few seconds to get it in place, push it down, wiggle it around a bit. That looks about straight. There we go. So yeah, it's an old habit of mine. Sometimes it's because I can't be bothered and I just want to get, a, I've always said I'm a builder. I mean, I'm a builder. I've always said I'm a painter, not a builder. So sometimes, usually to me, the building part, the construction is the least interesting part of the whole project. Yeah, that is now in. That covers that gap beautifully. And once that's primed, you'll never know. Okay, so for the turret, uh, I've got this little piece of plastic card, which I cut up earlier on, and I roughly made it to the shape of this panel, but a bit smaller. Now you can see here where we saw earlier on, there was some splonk here where the guy had, or the girl had tried to glue something on and it had come off. We need to quickly file that down. So I'm not gonna be delicate here. I'm just gonna go straight in and fire the living crap out of it. Yes, Kajit will file for you. Kajit will file if you have coin. So I just need to get this nice and smooth because it's thin plastic card and it will show nonsense like this. So let's just very quickly file this down. Looking nice and smooth. It's looking flat enough to glue something onto uh, and it's not so lumpy that it's going to show through the plastic card. So this should be dead easy now. Just going to quite simply put this on. Now I've designed this to look a little smaller than the actual panel itself. So this is really easy. We'll get the extra thin, because again, I want to be able to move this around just in case I need to reposition it. What I'm gonna do is run the extra thin along there. Being extra thin, of course, it will be sucked underneath through capillary action, yes. And it does mean if I needed to, I'd have a few moments to, to wiggle it around, but it seems to be, I seem to be in a position where I've actually got it in exactly the right place and it stayed there. I don't understand. Normally doesn't work that well. There's normally something sent to frustrate me. But clearly this time, the gods have smiled down upon my endeavour. And allowed me to proceed with caution. There. That's on. Done. The next step is rivets. So I've got two sets of rivets. I've got some 5mm and some 0.2, uh, sorry, 0.5mm and 0.25mm rivets. My very good friend Kenneth made these for me. Kenneth in Australia land. And I'm going to use, for this panel, I'm going to use the 0.25, I think. Let's have a look. Don't sneeze. Mm, a bit small. Let's go for big fat ass rivets. These might be better. Yeah, it's much better. We'll go for the 0.5s. Uh, now, if you want to make your own rivets, 
I don't really know how Kenneth made them. I think he has a rivet making tool. It's like a punch that punches out little ton of circles from plastic card. So get a tool like that or just get a thin plastic card rod and chop it really finely into little studs. Uh, or just have a friend like Kenneth who can make rivets for you. <laughs> you can get rivet making tools that just make little rivet shapes out of plastic card. But all I'm going to do is, all you need for this is the glue and the knife. And what you quite simply do is, get your knife ready. Tiniest touch of glue, you don't want a splob of glue. And then just pick up a rivet with the tip of your knife. Plonk. Done. There's a rivet. I'll just quickly touch it with the brush. Not much glue on there at all, just to lock in. Done. And that's it, that's riveting. I'll do that's riveting, that is. Do another one there in that corner. Now I don't know if there's supposed to be rivets on here, but I like doing rivets so much. That I'm going to put rivets on it. Rivet. Rivet. Do a barrel roll. So there we go. That is that riveted. So we've got four rivets there for that square plate, and then it just this bit here. That kind of makes sense. So if I can close, go a bit closer for you. There you go. And that's riveting. So a big massive thank you to my very dear friend Kenneth, who did those rivets for me. They are fantastic. Look at that. That's brilliant. That looks like a plate that's supposed to be there. Now I will do some more rivets across the hole. There are other places on the body where um, there are already rivets on this kit. I'm going to add more rivets where I see fit, like on these back plates here. I'm not going to show you that though, but I will go ahead before we do the painting and put lots more rivets on. Uh, but yeah, that's the rivets. Alrighty, so that's those bits all riveted up now, looking rather funky. Next up, we need to add some greebly details. Uh, you can see here, I've glued a thing on here. I've got a load of these little hatch covers. And I want to glue these on. I've got one to put on here, and I've done some on the main body as well, over there. I want to put one on here. The problem is, that the part itself has this detail on the bottom. Yes, it's got that kind of lip, which we don't want. We need it to be flat so it can just go straight on the surface. And this is very easy to fix. Get myself some lovely, lovely nippers. These are my Mr. Hobby, Mr. Tools, Mr. Nipper nippers. Stupid name. Uh, if you've got some God hands, don't use them for this. They will explode. What I'm going to do, these are nice, he not heavy duty, but they're good medium duty nippers and good for things like this. The Citadel nippers, the cutters, the fine detail cutters, they're probably a bit too a bit too hardcore. You'll end up gouging the piece of plastic all over the place. And I'm going to get my blade very carefully, very carefully. Remember, if you're a child or an idiot, you might want to get someone to help you with this. I am an idiot. I just don't have anyone to help me, so I have to take the risk. Now I'm going to very quickly just kind of scrape this flat a bit more carefully as I can. Now I'm not too worried about it looking pretty. A bit like when we cleaned up the side of the, uh, the turret. I don't care what this looks like because you're not going to see this. What it looks like is irrelevant. What it needs to be is flat and that's all I care about. And all we need to do now is basically get this on there. Uh, now, if you are lining up greebles like this, I do recommend getting the piece where you want it roughly. Get yourself some Tamiya Extra Thin. Just run it along the edge like that. It'll suck underneath and you've got a few seconds in which you can wiggle and twiddle and just manoeuvre it around into the right place. There we go. That seems about right and lined up, I think. Similar to the other one. A little bit further down, perhaps. You've just got a few moments just to gently move it, but because you've got it almost in the right position to start with, you're not having to move it too much. So get it roughly where you want it so that your wiggling is minimal. Next, I have one more piece uh, that I want to stick on the back, uh, which is this piece here. Uh, now, there was a knob in the middle here which cleaned up horribly. It was horrible to get to and I couldn't get it out. So I had a bit of a ding left in the plastic. So what I've done is these two bits here are little squares with the nub on them. So all I did was I cut out a bit of plastic card. I made a little square and stuck a rivet on it. Now it's not exactly the same, but it looks about right. I'm going to stick this on here like that because I think that looks cool. Now I've also cleaned up the back here to make it nice and flat and flush. So what we'll do here is I will hold that in place. Touch that there. Touch this here. There we go. 
Again, it's Tamiya Extra Thin. It's all about the Caterpillar action. I can't stress strongly enough, if you are making models and you're used to using tubes of cement or Revell Contactor or Tamiya Regular Cement that's really thick and gloopy, do yourself a favour, or even a favour even, get yourself some proper thin cement like Tamiya Extra Thin or there's the Ammo by Mig Equivalent. That looks great. I love that. That looks fantastic. <laughs> that's on now. There you go. I would recommend the fast setting stuff as well as a as a sort of side kit to this. I recommend that be your main glue. That be a just in case you need to get something on quickly and you don't want it falling off. And I do have the regular cement as well. This comes in handy when you're gluing two big flat things together and you need some viscous suckety contact so things stick together just by surface tension for a few seconds, like gluing a figure to a base. So I do recommend get yourself a whole range. Tamiya Extra Thin is your go-to. Tamiya Regular Cement for occasional things and Extra Thin for a quick setting just for when you need to, something to glue together instantly. Right, I'll go and let that dry for a bit and I'll get the next bit ready. Back in a moment. Now the next step is to apply this searchlight to this turret. Now there is no way for me to attach it. I don't have any of the mounting points that this would normally go on to. Uh, and by the way, while I'm here, you'll notice I have trimmed away the pintle that the big um, stubber used to go on that was sticking out there. I've just trimmed it back. I couldn't get rid of it completely, so I just trimmed it back to look like a bit of the, of the cupola on the turret there. So it looks fine. But we need to attach this now. What I'm going to do is drill a hole in here and just sponk it in the side there. Nothing too complicated. But what I do want to do, I need to make sure it sits straight like that and not like this. I don't want that. Now you could just sand this down and stick it on, but I'd rather drill a small hole and be able to sort of get in there. So what I'm going to do, I've got myself uh, my pin vise here. I'll start with the medium bit just because it's easier to drill with a little bit. Now what I want to do is I want to, like I say, keep this at an angle. So I'm actually going to make sure I'm drilling at an angle like that straight. You can see that I've got it at an angle. So it probably won't make any difference at all. Let's be perfectly honest, but it's worth giving it a go. I've roughly marked the center there with the pencil. So what I'm doing is I'm going at this funky angle through my plastic, beautiful, beautiful plastic card that I just stuck on there earlier. Hopefully this is lined up. Now this, of course, won't be anywhere near big enough. There we go. So now we can go in with the slightly bigger bit. Now this bit itself, and again, these are the standard GW bits that come with the, the drill. Then it's not quite the right size. It's almost the right size, but not quite. The actual mounting point for the gun is a bit fatter. So again, we're going to just widen this hole now. Still at a cool angle. It probably won't make any difference at all, but it's worth a try. What can possibly go wrong? Now, if I get myself my little round file, I can try and widen that. So here we go, my round file. I'm just going to get in the little hole and just widen it just a tiny amount. I don't want to change the shape of it too much, but I do want to widen it. It's quite messy, but that's fine. It doesn't really matter. Let's trim that bit of plastic card away. You can see now why I wasn't really keen to use the knife blade, but it's fine. Oops, stop dropping it, that would help. There we go. That can sit on there. I can just bend it back a little bit to make it straight. And then we can glue that in. Cool. So I'll go and get that glued in and we'll move on to the next bit. Back in a moment. And there we have it, the searchlight is done, looks cool. There's a bit of roughness around the gap in the plastic card, but I might try and fix that a bit later on with some easy line to make some kind of dangly wire, so I'll show you that in a bit. But that's going to sit over there and dry for a while. Next up, we have to go back to the main part of the tank. Uh, I need to fix this aerial, and I need to fix these things here. Uh, now, for these things here on the sponsons, I have in my hand... Uh, two smoke launchers, smoke things. Now I've drilled these out. I always get told off because I don't drill out the ends of the smoke launchers. And I, I looked into it and I can't quite figure it out. If you look at some photographs of tanks, some of these have holes and some of them have caps on the top. And as far as I can tell, smoke dispensers tend to just be tubes, whereas grenade launchers tend to have 
caps over the end. So I'm going to assume these are smoke dispensers and not grenade launchers. I've done the same on the turret here. I've actually drilled those out. They're already on there. I've just drilled those out to make them look again like smoke dispensers. Because I reckon let's have all the smoke in the world. Now I want to put these on here to cover up these broken parts that don't seem to be doing anything. So what I'm going to do is take out my lovely Mr. Hobby, Mr. Tools, Mr. Nippers again and just quite simply nip these off. One. Okay, now I'm going to come in with the knife and what I'm going to try and do is start to just gently scrape these away. Now this is not how I would normally hold a knife when I'm doing this but I've not got a lot of options here. So I'm going to slowly scrape these bits away. Okay, I've gone ahead and cleaned those up and just sanded them quickly with the file just to get them nice and flat. And this next step, just a quite a simple case really of getting these on and sticking them in place. Now obviously the plates are different. You've got the square plate here and you've got this kind of squiggly plate here. It doesn't really matter. It's not it's not ideal, but it's not the end of the world. I'd make a much horrible, more horrible mess of things if I tried to clean up and remove those plates altogether. And I'd rather not do that. So I'll just put that there. I shall just using regular knocking the camera. Just using regular Tamiya Extra Thin. Just to get that in place. And we will squish that down. There we go. Right, and the next step, uh, gluing more details on. I have a small collection of these very small entrenching tools. And on this one, you can see I've glued a little tiny bit of plastic card right on the end there. And that's because I want to glue this one here, like that. I want to put it on this box at the back. Now, you don't have to do this, but it makes sense, of course, if you're going to have something mounted on the hull of the tank, like a, a spade or an entrenching tool or something like that, it kind of needs something to hold it in place. I just need to get that on there. Uh, I have a small amount of the extra thin, which I will apply there for the moment, just to anchor it. Oops, it's going to stick to my finger. I think for this we might go for the fast setting, actually. Let me just get out the fast setting. Right, that's that glued on. Uh, now, for the other ones, uh, I have uh, two other spades, or entrenching tools. Uh, one there, and one... Very hard to pick up, one here. And I've also got three las guns. And what I intend to do with these is actually just put these in this storage bin at the back. But not in any great way, just quite simply just gluing them in place, plop them in and glue them as if it's like the crew have got these las guns and they're just stowed them just temporarily. Uh, maybe they're outside the tank doing something. So I've got three las guns there. And what I'll probably do is have the entrenching tools just kind of sticking out like that. So we'll get these las guns glued in first. Now, I should note, I have drilled out the barrels of the last guns. Yes, I know, heresy, heresy. Um, would it not be make more sense just to have a crystal at the end of the barrel? Because it's a laser rifle. Why would you have a barrel with a hole in it? Well, uh, in my mind, it would make more sense to have the barrel of the rifle hollow and have the lens, because there's probably a lens in there, the lens recessed in from the tip of the barrel a bit, just so it avoids getting scratched and broken whilst, you know, out and about and while the rifle being dropped and manhandled. So in my mind, it makes more sense to have a hollow barrel with a hole in the end, which I think you can see there, that the lens is further inside. Okay, so that's those two in. And for the entrenching tools, I will just jam these in. Willy McNilly. Just like they've jammed them in. Maybe there's nobody in the tank right now. They're all outside having a cup of coffee or something. Or whatever the Warhammer equivalent of the coffee is. Probably ground up people, I would suspect. There we go. So that's that glued on there. So then we have this stowage bin full of goodness. Now, in reality, of course, if it was a real vehicle and a real tank, that would have netting and stowage netting and things like that. If it was a proper trenching, uh, entrenching tool, if it was a proper stowage area. But we're just having a bit of fun here. It's not the end of the world. Now, there is one more thing I need to add. Uh, I need to add, well, there's a few more things. I need to add, get rid of this. Now, I do have the back of a Vox unit. It's a backpack Vox unit from an Imperial Guard dude. And all I've done is I've cut off the bottom half that makes it a backpack. And I've put some plastic card on the back there where it's hollow just to seal it in. And all we're going to do is snip this bit off 
and replace it with that Evox unit. Because there's usually an aerial here, but it's not gonna be really feasible for me to, oh, ping, that was easy. Not really feasible for me to replace it with something else because I'd have to drill out the tiny little hole and then the beer probably I'd mess it up and it wouldn't really work. So we'll just carve this flat. Again, I don't need to be too careful here. Big priority is just getting it flat. There we go. Quick zizz with the sanding sponge just to smooth it down. I could do this with a file, but to be honest, getting a file in there will be a right pain in the bum. There you go, that'll do. And then we're just literally going to glue that on here. The reason I didn't worry about it being looking pretty and all I just needed it to do was be flat is because I'm going to cover that, cover it with that, basically. That whole sentence was a complete train wreck, wasn't it? Wow. I'm going to go for the fast setting cement again. Uh, so we could put it there. We could do it at a jaunty angle, like it's um, like it's a Vox set mounted on the back of the uh, tank. Uh, or would it be better that way? Let's have a think. Sticking out that way. Yeah, because otherwise it's going to cover this vent, isn't it? I know you're at the wrong angle to see. So let me get some of this fast setting cement. We will put a touch of it under there and just block it down. And there we go. And that is now. Fiximitated to the tank. There we go. Now I know it's not correct, it's not, you know, you don't have half a backpack Vox unit on the back of a tank, but it gives us an aerial where there was no aerial before, and it saves me having to drill stuff out. Remember, uh, in the weasel world of my mind, it's always better to use something that takes less effort than something that's really, really complicated. That's my mantra. You know, you can do complicated drawn out things, or you can keep things simple. As one of my friends used to say, kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. It looks just as good and it doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect the way this plays in game, so it doesn't matter. At left we have, I won't show you these bits, but left over we have, yeah, uh, we have some handles, some grab handles. We have a couple of aquila, aquilae, aquilae. I don't know the plural of, I'm not big on Latin, so I don't know the plural of eagle in Latin. I oh, cut my finger. Aquilas, I'll put them somewhere. And I also have this backpack one thing I forgot the covers for the turret this is what they normally look like that bit solid but to make it fit around the little nubs that are left from the old uh, hatches all I did was quite simply cut that bit out there you can see there's a little notch cut out which originally looked like that dead simple just knife 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 carve it out and now it fits nicely uh, over those little lumps and bumps when I put the hatch on there so I'll glue that hatch on there there's nothing really to show you about that anyway I'll go and get them bits done back in a minute So we're pretty much done now for the extra details. All that remains to do before we can get to the priming and the painting is to fill up some of these nasty seam lines. We've got one here on the big cannon. We've got one going all the way along the last gun on the front, on the last turret. And we've got some on the exhaust pipes here at the back. Now, normally when you're making a model, you can fill these by just gluing them and squishing it together and the glue squeezes out. And then you can file that back and you make a nice smooth surface because the glue fills the gap with the melted plastic. We can't do that here because it's already been built and squished together or not squished together the next step is to try and fill it now some people like to use putties and fillers I can't be bothered I'm king of the weasels if I can weasel out of doing something but get an equally good result I will can't be bothered with always filling with putty and nonsense what I use instead is this amazing product called sprue goo look at this classy label on the front here that's professionally it's not you make it yourself you get yourself a pot of Tamiya extra thin and you get yourself uh, lots and lots of little bits of leftover sprue or little bits of kit that you're not going to use. Cut them down into tiny, tiny pieces. You can use plastic card as well. And you just dump a whole metric mess into your pot of extra thin. It has to be polystyrene. You can't use ABS or any other kind of plastic. So I wouldn't recommend using plastic from a Bandai kit. The polystyrene will melt in the glue to a liquid. You put in enough that it's really gloopy and doesn't run. It just about drips off the end of the brush there. You put in enough so it goes that thick and gloopy. And what happens is when you apply it to the model, you put it on the model, the glue evaporates away and leaves nothing but polystyrene behind. That's the way this works. And what we want to do is get the polystyrene 
into that little gap there. All I'm going to do is, and I recommend you work quickly because this stuff stinks, get some on the brush there. And I just want to very carefully just run it along that gap. And what I'm looking to do is really just make a bead of it over the gap. Is this on camera? Yes. Now I want to put in enough that it covers it. I don't want it to just sink into the gap. This is why you need to make sprue glue quite thick. You can't have it runny because it needs to make, not just cover the gap, but make a bead of glue over it, like a little mound. So that when it dries, you get this little bead of glue over that where there was the gap and you can sand that back because you want it to fill the gap and leave something on top. I'm going to work my way around and just cover this. Now, normally with sprue glue, you need to leave it for about 24 hours to fully cure for all the glue to flash off and leave the polystyrene behind. But for something like this, where you're putting on a tiny amount, leave it two or three hours and you should be good for sanding and just come back with it. Just go at it with a sanding sponge or you can use a file if you're able to, you know, confidently file a curved surface. If you want to maintain the curve, use a sanding sponge or sandpaper and get that sanded back. And when you're finished, you should have a nice smooth surface with no little recess. So I need to go and do that on that last cannon as well and on the exhaust pipes. And when we come back, we'll be done, ready for priming and painting. Back in a moment. And once that's cured and been sanded and cleaned up, preparation is complete. Well, almost complete. There's a few little sort of seam lines and mold lines that I can spot now. Now I'm reviewing this footage that I've just filmed. I can see a few little bits that I still need to go back and clean up. But that's always the way. You do all your hard work, you take a lovely photograph, and then you spot the thing that you missed. It's always the way. You can't see the wood for the trees. But that notwithstanding, that's all the prep work done now. And in the next episode of Tabletop Trauma Centre, we can crack on with the priming and the painting. Oh, I can't wait. I've got to recreate that really weird colour scheme. Very strange. Now, I hope you've enjoyed watching this. And if you have, I hope you'll like and subscribe if you're not already subscribed. And remember, if you want to support this channel and make sure that I can keep making content, please go to patreon.com forward slash modelmakingguru and consider becoming a Patreon supporter or clicking the join button under any of my content to become a YouTube channel member. Either way, you'll get ad-free content in advance every time. Until next time, though, it just remains for me to say thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Go make something awesome. Go be awesome. Go and have a look on eBay and see what you can pick up to play with. And until next time, adios amoebas.